Aloha, and welcome to Brooks, Books, Books, where we discuss reading, writing, and everything in between and beyond. I'm your host, David Dinner, coming to you from Kilauea on the island of Kauai, and on the Think Tech live streaming network series, broadcasting from our downtown studio at Finance Factors Center at the core of downtown Honolulu. Joining me today is Wayne Moniz. Wayne needs no introduction to Maui audiences, but for those of us elsewhere, today we are having the privilege of meeting an author who is so varied in his approach and diz in a dizzying number of genres. He's written dramas, musicals, short stories, novels, memoir, biography, and poetry. And I can tell you that's a lot. He was born and raised on Maui, received a BA in English and Communications in 1968 from the University of Dayton, Ohio. And in 1980, he was awarded an MA in Theater Arts and Film from UCLA. In 2005, he received the Cades Award for Literature, Hawaii's most prestigious writing prize for his body of work. His short story collection of Valley Isle, Isle Tales won him the Na Pala Pala Pookela 2010 Reader's Choice Book of the Year. The audiobook of Under Maui Skies and Other Stories was nominated for a Grammy in 2012 in the spoken word category. Dubbed the Dean of Maui Playwrights by the Maui News, Wayne has written works that deal with people, events, and issues of Hawaii. Wayne, welcome. It's so good to have you here. And I'd like to talk about some of your work right off the bat. Aloha, David. Under Maui Skies. Well, Under Maui Skies, everybody wants to write the great American novel, and I was no exception to the rule. But my plot was I wanted to find out what genre I should write in. So I decided what I'll do is I'll write a number of short stories, and I did seven in, in one book of short stories. And I would find out which genre would be the best to explore in terms of the great American novel. So I and all, all of these, of course, are centered on Maui for the first book. And the follow up I sent, I, I still centered on Maui, but it was also about the rest of the world, Maui in the world. So I wrote a Western adventure, a love story, a murder mystery, a war story, a sci fi and a uh, <laughs> and a ghost story. And uh, I, it didn't solve the issue because I really loved all the genres and I loved writing all the short stories. And I also thought writing short stories, that would be quick to write. No, there was a lot of research and it took just as long as writing a full novel. So anyway, uh, from that, I, uh, I have chosen for today uh, a reading from Under Maui Skies, which is the Western and is also the title of the uh, book. Now, in this uh, story, what's happening is uh, the sheriff comes to a cowboy at his campsite and tells him to watch a guy called Albert Devil to follow him because he's bringing opium from Kihei all the way up to Kula, and he's going to sell it up there to uh, this uh, particular person. So that's basically the story, and we see it from the viewpoint of the cowboy that's following the uh, Albert Devil himself. Apoc had not been on Maui long, maybe two years. He didn't come with the cane people. Shortly after he arrived, he burned a couple of folks in Wailuku, the county seat, and had to hightail it up to Kula to get away from irate clients. In Kula, Apoc bought and sold everything that could be bought and sold to cowboys and farmers, including Albert's flour. Now, what Albert Devil does is he disguises the opium in flour bags to take it up on the side of mules, of course, up to Kula. Apoc bubbled with enthusiasm at the sight of Albert Devil. Oh, so good to see you, Mr. Albert. I hope everything go well. What are you so damn cheery about, blurted Albert Devil. Well, so happy you have no problems. I ran into a kuna on the trail, but when I last saw him, he went to stop for a water break. That's his job. No problem. Good. You got the $5,000? Yeah, up in the ceiling. Safe. But we have time. Why rush? Go Santos Bar to celebrate, as the Howdy Man says, collaboration. 
Albert Devil growled back. What collaboration? I know exist. You never seen me before. Got it? Yes, boss. Mr. Apoc trembled. And no call me boss. Yes, boss. I mean, Mr. Devil. We go to bar now. Here, I put the bags up in the ceiling for safekeeping. Apoc dragged a stool over to the opening of the ceiling. He pulled down the money from its rice bag in the attic. See, no need count. He showed him a handful of twenties. You jip me, Pake, you die. I'm taking my barato. Albert Devil snatched the rice bag with the twenties from Apoc's hand and stuffed the contents into an empty flour bag. He grabbed a coffee cup from the sink, scooped out two cupfuls of opium, and put them into a second empty bag, popped out atop the money bag, and fastened it. Here, put up there. I'll get it when we come back from Santo's bar. Ramon watched the twosome walk down the street to Santo's bar with the sacks. The vaquero could see Mrs. Alpac washing down the front porch. After the men left, her cleaning frenzy moved into the kitchen. Lolo, husband, leave stool in the middle of... She climbed up at the trap door in the ceiling. It was ajar. Curious, she climbed up on the stool and groped about. She pulled down one of the bags of flour, stuck her finger in it, and took a taste. Yuck! Flour gone bad, stupid husband. Wrong place to store flour. Too hot, too much humid. She pulled all the bags down. She thought of tossing them down the gulch, but her crafty thriftiness got the best of her. She'd walk down the road and sell them to Lizzie Gomes, known for her pandus and malasadas. If Lizzie rejected the sour flour to make her sweet bread and sugar donuts, Mrs. Apoc was confident that she could at least wrangle $5 for those slightly used flour sacks. Ramon watched confused as Mrs. Apoc struggled with the flour bags down to Lizzie's place. He could see them negotiating. Lizzie finally reluctantly pulled the $5 bill from her bosom. Mrs. Apoc, bill in hand, raced home beaming. Lizzie headed for the pig pens and emerged a short time later, locked the front door, jumped on the buckboard, and headed to Makawao to make it in time for the social and the dance. The sun was setting as Ramon watched Mr. Apoc and Albert Devil swagger out of the tavern. As they approached Apoc's, Trouble, the troubled twosome looked at each other in horror and raced toward the house. Then all hell broke loose. Expletives were hurled along with dishes and furniture. Miss, Mr. Apoc and Albert Devil almost tore the front door as they exploded out onto the lawn. Like maniacs, they raced toward the Gomes place. Albert was in a fury as he dashed toward the locked front door. He raced around the back of the house where he spotted the bags draped over the pig pen fence. Then he went into shock. A trail of opium led away from the pens out to a grove of ohia trees, a tranquil setting for Liz Lizzie's outhouse. Albert Devil opened the door and shut it just as fast from the stench that singed his nostrils. Mr. Apoc, frantically trying to separate the illegal power powder from the barnyard dirt, looked up. Albert Devil had murder in his eyes. Apoc knew he had to run, and he did. With his work done and the money and drugs at the bottom of the Gomes's outhouse, Ramon galloped up the road. Dolores was home. The porch light lit to welcome him. Paor snorting drew Dolores and Sheriff Safri out to, to the porch. And so Ramon told the sheriff the whole story of Albert Devil as the moon peeked over Haleakala, the same moon that shines down on the just and unjust who live and die under Maui skies. That's great, Wayne. That's, that is so funny. You know, I I'm, was especially uh, taken with how you described to me earlier uh, the research that you did for that book and how you found out from all the local uh, old timers what the stories were. I thought that was wonderful. And I listened to that book on, on Audible, so I really got the real reading of it. I thought it was great that way. Thank you. So let, let's move on to uh, something else. And one of your. Um, special areas, in my opinion, is the uh, Akauna, uh, the poetry that you write. And I, I'd love you to explain that to the, to the viewers and maybe read one of yours, if you would. Yeah, I, I think it's the, uh, the one sign of a, of a very educated population or very intellectual ones who write this kind of poetry. And sometimes we think of the early, early Hawaiians as not in that mode. 
But as we find out more and more, their mele, their songs, their poetry have to do a lot with things like kauna. Now, kauna, according to Mary Pukui, is the hit means hidden meaning. Kauna means hidden meaning. But uh, it's a, a metaphorical poem where we're describing a person, but with, the, uh, it's with something in nature. So for example, most women, I have written counters about flowers. So that would make a lot of sense. And maybe some of my relatives, uh, males are fish, you know? So anyway, it represents something. And she says, Mary Pukui says the literal, it has a literal translation that's like your body. And then the kauna is like your soul. It's the spirit that's behind the poem itself. So anyway, I, I do, I think you wanna have me read a kauna maybe? Yes, and, and tell us something about the person that that involves, because I know we talked about that, and that was really interesting. Yeah, well, in this case, the one I'll read is of my aunt, one of my closest aunts. So I've dedicated all these comments. I put them at the back of every book, and they're dedicated to my friends, my relatives, etc. I try to do all my uh, maternal side and my paternal side and then also my friends. So, and you give this to them. A kauna is usually delivered orally to the person, but in some cases, like somebody's funeral, obviously you're reading to the, the people that are related to the person that has passed away. So anyway, this one is called the Night Blooming Sirius. Most people have seen these growing all around the islands. Uh, they're not uh, a typical flower of the island, but they've been growing here for generations. So we've, it's become part of the landscape. The night blooming Sirius, Kapanini o Kapuna Ho. O special flower, your arrival foreshadowed by perfume, the summer night warm, the moon full, the splashes in the waterway stilled. Everything sensitive to your bloom, rare magnificence, the glory of light, no matter how short, the matter how worthwhile. A double corona of yellow and white, transforming the rock wall modeled by a million stars. And as the morning Hong Wan Ji bells beat out slow, then fast, then faster, she starts to close, her sensual beauty gone, only memories now as we wait, wait to see her bloom again. That is a beautiful poem. I love the, the symbolism of that, Wayne. It's really nice. That's I'd love you to, to read a whole bunch of those, but I think <laughs> instead of that, we're going to go on to the next genre. I mean, it is so clear that you enjoy writing. It's just a love of yours that, that's so rare in writers. I hear a lot of writers complain about their, the torture they go through to write something, and there's such joy in your writing. I think it's so great. Um, yeah, the, the torture comes from getting all the measurements right when you do the covers and the, the right. interior of the book. <laughs> The trying writing to get it is into not, paper, not, right? <laughs> trying to get it into paper. That's the hard part. I should have so complained on Tech Hawaii here uh, about that, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I'm sure they've heard it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, let's let's go to Pukoko and uh, talk about that, how you got to write that book and something about it. I, I'd love to hear that. Yeah. Um, I, I, again, back to the great American novel, I was finally ready to write the novel, uh, throwing aside the short stories. I, Arnie Kotler, who was the publisher on my first book, gave me a call and said, hey, Wayne, you know, there's a ceremony taking place at Punch Bowl for Hawaiians who fought in the American Civil War. And of course, I went, what? A Hawaiian in the American Civil War? And most people have said that. So I felt that this was the perfect a topic for a novel because it hadn't been explored yet or rarely and certainly not in a uh, in novel form so i did most of the parts of it are based on actual things that happen so uh, uh, it, it's just a matter of adding some fiction here and there to to put the make it cohesive so anyway uh, uh, uh this pukoko moikea pukoko has a bad case of wonderlust and he heads to San Francisco on a steamer and he wants to see the world and do things. And he finds out, and I found out, that uh, the Union Navy was, uh, was training in San Francisco for the Civil War. And he, re his, he re uh, uh, joins up and uh, he uh, meets uh, up with David Farragut down in New Orleans. He goes overland through Mexico to get to New Orleans. And once he's in New Orleans, then he's with the Great Battle of New Orleans. 
Anyway, he moves up river and he's shot and he falls into the river. And all of this starts the great cross country adventure that he's on. Blood oozed from Moikea's arm and mixed with the river. He passed out. A stench woke him. He was being dragged and could only look back to where he had come from. He turned his head around as far as he could until pain shot through his arm and memory of its cause. He was looking at a mule's rear end upside down. Excuse me, Bessie went and farted. When she does, it can raise the dead. The movement came to a stop. A black man got off the mule and walked around. A hound dog with a sad face stared at Moikea. I was fetching biscuit root and wild asparagus grows thick here when I hear the gunfire. Come over and found you among the reeds, pulled you out of the river. Where am I? asked Moikea weakly. Used in Tensas Parish, Louisiana, just above St. Joseph. We off to Big Pond where I got me a shanty to take care of you a bit. You got a mean wound there. Was the white man taking you back to the plantation and you run? Which one you work on, asked the black man. Oh, shucks, too many questions for an injured man along the trail here. You just rest. Questions and answers will come in due time. Oh, by the way, he added, here's, my, here's Gabriel, my old hound dog. Moikea lay his head back down on the travoy and fell asleep to the rhythmic clops of old Bessie and the, painting of, and the panting of Gabriel as the journey to Big Pond continued. Time passed. We is here, mister. Mister, by the way, what's your name? Moikea tried to shake his grogginess to answer the man's question. Moikea, he finally answered, looking up at a quaint shack. Sure is a funny name. Maybe your father's an Indian? Maybe your mama, she's a Negro lady? What plantation you come from? You run away like me? Oh, I'm not from any plantation. I'm a Hawaiian. Hawaiian? What's a Hawaiian? I'm from the Sandwich Isles, out in the Pacific Ocean. Well, I'll be. I never met me a Hawaiian before. You folks eat each other? Moikea laughed. Oh, no, no, no. We practice aloha. You know, love. My mammy tell me that all the time before she died. Son, it's all about love. Maybe she a Hawaiian. Here, let me help you inside. My shanty taint much. I found it when I run away from the masa. The, the black man propped Moikea up under his shoulder and lugged him in. He lit a lantern after he lay him down in his bed. I hope you don't mind if I wash you down seeing you can't do it yourself. You muddier than a pig in a sty. The runaway slave started a small fire in the pot belly stove and soon the kettle of water was boiling. The man who pulled him from the river washed Moikea from head to foot. Moikea said, just like Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. Oh, you knows about Jesus way out there in the Sandwich Isles? The missionaries brought the word. Although I still pray to the gods of my ancestors, it doesn't hurt to have all the gods praying for you. Now this part bound to hurt. I got to clean this wound. This here's Willow Park base will heal you in no time. I promise the Lord no alcohol, so I can't give you the for the pain. So here. Moikea's eyes got heavy. Time passed quickly. He was awakened for the dinner call. Hate to wake you, Moi, but you need some fixings in your stomach. He handed him a worn plate and a mango fork and poured him coffee in a cup that had seen his days. What's this called? It's called crappy. The white man called it perch. You heard of it? We don't have too many fr fresh water lakes, but I heard about it at school. You gone to school? And you a black man? I wish I'd have gone but I worked picking cotton since I was 11. I ne you are my guardian angel. You saved me from death and I'm most grateful. Can I call you the angel? I never considered myself an angel, but you can. That's why I give you my old hound dog named Napro, a uh, Gabriel. He's a runaway too. The chains that held him dug deep scars in his neck. He just come up to the shanty out of nowhere one day and keep me upright during those first lonely nights. He, my angel. Moikea fell asleep too, dreaming of angels sitting on the giant basalt boulders of Iao stream, their wings whiffling in harmony through the soft series of splashes from miniature waterfalls in the riverbed. That is beautiful, Wayne. <laughs> what a great story. That, that is a terrific book. 
and I would recommend to the to the listeners, to the viewers, I mean, to to uh, get that book. It's really good. But also, what I want to say is that you have a new book out, and I think a few words about that is in order. So, tell us about it, please. Yeah, it it's just an offshoot, David, of uh, the uh, the Civil War story because the person that got me going into that direction about the story she gave me, her great grand uncle was from Hawaii and was in the American Civil War. Mm -hmm. So that was a great source to start. And then I picked up a couple of those other stories from Hawaiians that, uh, that were in the Civil War. So before she passed away, Edna asked me, Edna Ellis asked me to write a biography. I had never written a biography before. And I might decided, well. well, I might as well do this one too, <laughs> see how this works. But anyway, it's a short biography of, of Edna's life, and I was happy to do it and uh, for all her friends and family and the Elks Club in Honolulu. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And it's called, uh, say the name again. Uh, Kamakani Uhane. Kamakani Uhane, the spirit wind. Spirit wind. Yeah, that's what I wanted to get in there. So Wayne, And I all these on Amazon, by the way, so... I think we still have a few minutes, and I'd love to to listen to the way that you write and some something about your writing process. I know you do a lot of research for your books, and anything you want to say about your process and how it how it might fit for other people. Yeah. Really like well, technically speaking, in the early days, I would write like Woody Allen and a whole bunch of people write with the yellow tablets and write everything down. I still use the yellow tablets for research, so I jot down anything and everything. And I, I, I try to say this way, I, I take everything into consideration, then I kind of throw it out and whatever remains <laughs> becomes part of the story or the novel. You know what I mean? I take in kind of too much information some days. Sure, sure. But I also make lists of, you, you wanted to talk a little about local color too. I know we talked about this before. And you could see in the story of uh, Pac uh, that, uh, and, uh, uh, the, uh, the the sheriff and the the deputy that uh, I use a lot of local color. It's it's not just another western. In fact, it separates most westerns from each other. You know, it's the local color that changes the western. So a Hawaiian western already sets it apart from all the rest of the westerns. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. And then uh, you ahead. Oh, that's anyway, weird. that's part of the local color that I use there. Yeah, and I notice in some of your uh the one western um uh story that i re that i read uh it was very western and it felt so authentic uh it just brought back some of those days gone by that we don't see much anymore here and it's really great i thought that was wonderful uh -huh. so sometimes they make little lists of uh terminologies from that time period from that place and then insert it where it's uh applicable it's a good it's a good technique and um, I just think that's it's really great to to read the variety that you've written. Uh, so I also wanted to talk for a minute about your your teaching experiences because you're so at ease. I can tell uh, the way that you come across that that you've had teaching experience. So uh, tell us something about that, would you, Wayne? Yeah. Uh, well, I basically taught every level of education. I uh, I started with doing preschool. And then, and, and I, I taught in the grade school, then I taught in the high school, and I taught in a four, community college, and I taught in the four-year university at UCLA. So I've had a lots of experience with people at all kinds of levels, and that certainly helps when you're, uh, when you're teaching. That's one thing. Had a, they, I did get a teacher of the year from Maui one year, but uh, that was, you know, that's a nice... Uh, a little tribute, but other than that, it's been a wonderful. I always loved my students; they're they they were great. What was what was Maui like in your early years? You've been there a long time, and of course, you've been back and forth to the mainland. But but you've spent a lot of time on Maui and seen some tremendous changes. I wonder what if you could give us a taste of that. Well, well, you know, that's kind of why I also started writing too, because I felt that Maui was like all the other islands are going pretty fast. You have the, the uh, so-called progress of the islands, and I could see it changing uh, pretty fast. Uh, it, during the pandemic, it reminded me of the old days because I would drive along Ka Manu, I'd, I'd be the only car on there. And, and, and growing up in Maui in the 50s, that was pretty true. You know, there was hardly any traffic and and. So well, I, I moved to Kauai in uh, in two thousand, the year two thousand, and I mean you could drive 
down the main highway at nine o'clock at night and there would not be a soul on the road. And now every, every little town has a different night of the week where they're celebrating stuff with cars all over the place and you can't get through the traffic. And it's a, it's a different place, but, but still beautiful, still wonderful. And I love it. Yeah, true. So what are you reading nowadays? Uh, what am I reading? I, uh, w- I'm reading uh, uh, books from two people that I actually know. And one is called Black Inside, Vir- Virginia Cantara, who's one of my old drama students from way back when, who wrote a wonderful book about her grandparents growing the Philippines during the Second World War with the invasion of the Japanese into the Philippines. And it's a hard novel. You can see Black Inside. Uh, she's Black on the outside, but with the sorrow and the sadness, they can be Black on the inside as well. And also, uh, uh, San, um, uh, Sandy Mar- uh, Miranda's book is called Tuning In. And it's, uh, S- Sandy was a disc jockey in the Bay Area. Half of the book is, she was at the beginnings of Silicon Valley, worked for Apple and all those big companies when they first started. So we get the, the birth of Silicon Valley in the first half of the book. The second half is her calling, the vocation to be a, a great uh, radio broadcaster and all the people that she met along the way, all the celebrities. That sounds like a great book. Well, I'm more mainstream right now. I'm, I'm listening to Ken Follett's book, The Evening and the Morning, and it's all uh, medieval, uh, early. Uh, English Norman um, conflict, and it's it's a very long book. By the time I get to the end, I'm sure I will have completely forgotten the beginning. So, <laughs> but that's the way it is. So uh, we have just one minute left, and Wayne, I just want to tell you what a pleasure it's been to talk to you. I, I got to know you a little bit before the show, and uh, it, you've just come across so well to me, and and I've learned a lot about your writing and your process, and I, I so appreciate that. So thanks for coming on. And uh, I'm just going to begin to to close the show now, I think, and say that that's all the time we have today. And I want to thank uh, Wayne Moniz, sorry, uh, for being my special guest, our broadcast engineer and our floor manager, and Jay Fidel, our executive producer. A special mahalo to our underwriters. And thank you for joining us. Books, books, books. We'll be back in two weeks. Until then, read, write, and create your world. Thank you so much, Wayne. Ahoy ho. Ahoy ho. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.